the we are the provider firm uh, for Legal Shield in Pennsylvania, and we've been doing this now in Pennsylvania for no Emmy, 25 years at least, something like that. Long time. We've been doing this for a long time. And uh, we really appreciate all of the associates joining us this, e this evening. You know, we decided last year that we wanted to uh, do as much as we can to support uh, associates out there that are, that are selling. And one of the things that we uh, try to do to support you all in your efforts is to hold monthly associate workouts, right? Where we talk about uh, benefits and have a little bit of an in-depth conversation about the various benefits in the different products that you're out there marketing so that you better understand it. Because if you better understand it, you're going to be able to make your um, prospects and your customers better able to understand it. Uh, a more educated customer, we think, is going to be a happier customer. So we are really, we really appreciate you joining us uh, for our event this evening. And tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about the referral process. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, Noemi is going to enable me to share my screen here in just a moment. And when I do, I've got a little slide deck that I'm going to go through with you and we will uh, talk a little bit about that. Okay. Be good. I got it. Okay. No, let me just give me a thumbs up that you can see that. Awesome. Okay. So the referral process, uh, what, how, and when. That's what we're going to be talking about this evening. So I can only speak for our experience, but my guess is that this experience is about the same for all other providers. Um, our attorneys internally handle about 95% of the requests for services that we receive from Legal Shield members, meaning if you're a member, you have pretty much a 95% chance that whatever it is that you want to talk to us about, it's going to be handled with a telephone consultation, a document review, a phone call from one of our attorneys, or maybe we've written a letter for you. The vast majority of requests for services are handled by the attorneys at the provider law firm. But there are some instances when we have to uh, refer members to another lawyer. Maybe it's a lawyer inside of our own firm for some expanded services, or maybe it's an attorney in our network of referral attorneys. And that's less than 5% of requests for services that we receive. And that's, that's really what we're talking about here this evening. So let's go over a little bit about what we're gonna discuss this evening. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about when a matter is referred. So what do we consider a referral whenever somebody calls us? What matters are not referred? So we don't refer everything that uh, a, a member would like us to make a referral to an attorney on. What exactly is the preferred member discount or preferred member benefit? I wanna talk a lot about that as well so that you can help your members understand what, exactly what they're gonna be getting. We'll talk a little bit about the referral attorney network that is proprietary and that we've developed over a number of years. And then we're also going to talk about the process, the referral process so that um, you can help your customers better understand what they should expect uh, after we have made a referral uh, to an attorney. And then finally, again, what to expect after the referral is made. So when is a matter referred? This is literally a quote out of the contract. It's uh, referred for legal matters that are not otherwise provided by this contract. And so what does that mean? Um, it applies to matters that are both covered and not covered by the membership benefits. And that might sound a little bit confusing. So let's talk a little bit about that. So matters that are covered, but that aren't handled by a telephone call, a document review, writing a letter or making a phone call on behalf of a member would include matters that cut, fall under the trial defense benefit. So if you have a civil litigation that's covered, by the trial defense benefit, we're going to refer you to another attorney, either in our firm or outside of our firm, to provide representation for you for those services. That's covered by the membership contract, but not provided by our frontline lawyers that are dealing with the vast majority of requests for services that we receive. Tax or audit matters probably will also be referred to a lawyer. Traffic matters, obviously, I think that one's 
pretty easy to understand. If you've got a traffic hearing, you're going to need somebody to attend that hearing for you. And that's going to be typically an outside attorney. In most states, some states, um, I'm totally jealous of them. If they let the lawyers handle them by phone, might be somebody in the referral uh, office. I think Kansas allows us to do that. Last time I talked to Mike Reiling about that. And then uh, document reviews that are beyond the page limit that is covered, um, that is a free document review in whatever the, the uh, contract is. So all of them have different page limits. You know, if it's the family plan, I believe it's uh, 15, 15 pages that are typically covered. So if it's more than that, and it's substantially more, not just a couple of pages more, but substantially more, then that might get referred to a different lawyer, probably in our office to uh, take a look at those documents. So now um, I also talked about things that are not covered by the membership um, benefits. So litigation matters um, that aren't covered by the trial defense um, are going to be referred and that's going to be pretty much covered under your trial defense benefits. So examples of that would be a divorce case that is not a, an uncontested divorce or a child custody proceeding or a child support uh, proceeding something like that, or a litigation matter where the member is a, the plaintiff, the one who initiates the lawsuit. So it's not a defense case. Um, that's gonna be referred under the preferred member discount benefit. And then matters that fall into exceptions to the other benefit coverages. So again, contested divorce, pre-existing traffic matters uh, that occurred before the person became a member, uh, lawsuits th that um, might otherwise be covered by the trial defense, but it's excluded because of one of the various exclusions. And um, commonly, uh, those involve drug or alcohol related charges. So if you're involved in an auto accident, or you're a defendant in an auto accident, and you're cited for DUI, um, the DUI citation is going to exclude you from uh, coverage under the trial defense benefit. But we would still be able to refer you to somebody under the preferred member discount to handle that matter. So not everything is referred. Some things are not referred. And I think this is a really important thing for you all to understand because this is where we end up with, I don't want to say compl complaints, but uh, member concerns, member resolutions, uh, disappointments by customers uh, because they may have a, um, uh, an incorrect expectation that we're going to be able to refer them for all different types of or any type of legal matter. So some matters that we can't refer them on are matters with, they give us insufficient notice. So let's say they call us and say, I have a hearing tomorrow. I'd like a lawyer to attend for me. We're probably not going to refer them for that because we just don't have enough time to place them with a lawyer in our referral network um, and have all of the things that need to happen in order for them to have an attorney you know, at their office. So we have to be able to connect them with that lawyer they have to get the information about the underlying legal matter to that lawyer. Um, the lawyer needs time to prepare for the hearing, to review those documents, to interview the, the, the member, the client, to prepare a hearing strategy or a trial strategy. Um, the client has to pay the fees. So all of those things have to happen and they all take time. Um, if there's insufficient notice, we're not gonna be able to make that referral for the member, unfortunately. Um, another example of insufficient notice would be if somebody calls us and they have a deadline that they need to meet. So perhaps they have an appeal that needs to be filed in just a day or two or a couple of days, um, or they have a statute of limitations running, meaning um, if they don't file a lawsuit by the time that that statute of limitations runs, that they will lose their right to sue for whatever that underlying cause of action. And sometimes we do have folks who call us um, too close to that deadline where there's simply not enough time for us to connect them with an attorney who can be prepared sufficiently to meet that deadline. And oftentimes lawyers are very reluctant to take cases from clients that are too close to the, de to the deadline because they might miss something in the rush to get something filed and they won't be able to fix that after the deadline passes. And so they're usually very reluctant to take those types of cases. Uh, expiring deadlines, I already talked about that one. Um, matters for which there are 
uh, no benefits. So there, there are matters that there are no benefits. So um, if you have, if you are a, if you have a, a membership um, as part of an employer group uh, plan, um, there's an amendment to your plan that says that you can't use the membership for matters against your your employer. Uh, that's a matter that there are no benefits for, and we can't even refer you to a lawyer uh, under the preferred member discount so that you can pursue that legal action against your employer. Um, you can't sue Legal Shield um, uh, um, for using your membership or um, anybody that's associated with the company. So there are some matters that there are just no benefits for that we can't make a referral for you. Um, we can't refer you for matters that are really matters of non-members. So you've called to say, my mom has this um, issue. She's not a member, but I'd like for you to refer me, ref give me a, the lawyer's, a lawyer's name and number that can represent my mother. You know, sometimes we're able to help you uh, with those situations as a courtesy, um, and we try our best, but there's technically um, no right under the contract to use your membership benefits for anybody that isn't a member as that's defined under your plan. You know, it might be that you have a family plan, but there is a matter involving a business that you own, an incorporated business. There are no business benefits under your family plan. You're not really entitled to have a referral um, to, for your business for that business related matter, you know, under your plan. We may be able to accommodate you as a courtesy but that's not something that is covered um, under your plan. Matters outside of the US. This is not something that happens frequently for us in Pennsylvania. It might happen if you are uh, closer to a border of some kind. Typically when it happens for us, it's uh, something in, in Canada. Maybe a member has some property in Canada and they need a real estate attorney to do that. We might as a courtesy, see if one of the provider firms in Canada would be willing to assist the member, but there's no right to have referrals uh, to uh, attorneys outside of the United States. And so that would also apply to contracts that are governed by foreign law. And sometimes we do see those. Um, we can't refer folks to lawyers in the Bahamas or um, Bermuda or you know, any, of those, any of those places. Um, this is one that's the most difficult to describe, but it's important for you to understand. Um, we, we don't refer matters that lack merit, and that's really a judgment call on our part, but it is our judgment call under the contract. You'll see it in the general conditions or the general provisions to the contract. And sometimes somebody will call us uh, because they've got a, a case that they want to file, want somebody to pursue, and it just, it lacks merit. You know, the sort of the classic example are the folks who don't think that the federal government has the right to assess taxes against you, and they want to sue the federal government to object to that kind of a thing because they're having to pay taxes. I'm sorry, that's just a loser case, and we're not going to make a referral for, for somebody, you know, on that kind of a thing. But maybe they've had a couple of other um, law firms turn their case down and they're shopping, right? And this is uh, another place that they can shop to see if somebody will take their case. You know, that's another way uh, those come in uh, to us from time to time. Um, sometimes it's just, just not a good case because of the law. Folks may be absolutely convinced that they uh, have a, a good case, but we have to make a judgment call uh, on that. And sometimes we just have to tell somebody, no, um, we, we, we can't make a referral for you on that, uh, on that legal matter. Another reason, another significant reason why we won't make a referral is if the member cannot afford to retain an attorney. And we do try to have a practical uh, dollars and cents conversation with our uh, members who are looking to retain counsel for a legal matter. You know, lawyers take cases on lots of different basis, pay, payment basis, right? Hourly, flat fee, contingent basis, meaning the lawyer only gets paid in, uh, if there's a recovery and they get a percentage of the recovery. That's what contingent basis means. So we, we, 
we talked to folks about the economics of their case for a couple of different reasons. Sometimes um, the amount in controversy, what, what, whatever the client is seeking to obtain, if there's a, if there's a money dollars and cents value, you know, uh, we have to talk to them about the realities of the cost of litigation and help them understand that they might spend as much money litigating the case as they hope to recover, you know, in the case. And for the vast majority of civil cases that are filed out there, the winner is not entitled to be reimbursed their attorney's fees and costs by the loser. There are exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. So we want to talk to folks to make sure that they understand that that's the situation, the economic realities, um, that you're not going to, this, this may end up in no net money, you know, in your pocket. But we also want to talk to them so that they have a good understanding of what their financial commitment is going to be um, if they want to litigate and then ask them, can you afford to retain the attorney? And being able to afford to retain the attorney means on an hourly basis that you're going to have to pay a retainer. You know, you're going to have to prepay a certain amount to cover a number of hours that the lawyer is going to expend on your case, at least through the very beginning stages of the case. And they'll also ask for a prepayment of um, costs or expenses that um, would be expected to pay. So maybe filing fees, copy costs, you know, over whatever the costs might be in that particular case. So we try to give our clients an idea of what they might expect to pay on an hour, for an hourly type case. If it's a flat fee, then the client's probably going to have to pay the flat fee up front. There are exceptions to that. Bankruptcy is a case in point where they might not have to pay the entire flat fee up front. They might be able to make payments on that over time. Um, that might be one exception. But typically, if it's a flat fee related matter, they're going to have to pay that entire fee up front. Um, we want them to understand what they're going to have to pay up front and make sure that we're not trying to connect them with a referral attorney only for the referral attorney to spend time talking to that person and realize that this person can't afford to retain them. So we want to at least have some type of a practical conversation about that with the client up front so that we can help avoid some misunderstandings, you know, along the way, sticker shock, you know, kind of a thing. Now, some clients might say, I can't pay hourly, I can't pay flat, pay flat fee. Can the lawyer accept this on a contingent basis? And I would say that there are only certain types of cases that are handled on a contingent basis. Personal injury type actions, medical malpractice, products liability, um, slip and fall type cases, workers' compensation, social security disability. You know, those are the classic examples of cases that are handled on a contingent fee basis. Maybe if it's a business owner and they have collection case, the lawyer may be willing to take that case all on contingency or part flat fee, part contingency, right? But lawyers typically are not going to be willing to take a, a case that doesn't fall within one of those categories on a contingent fee basis. Um, that's just all there is to it. And so if a client is hopeful that a lawyer is going to agree to take it on that, and we know that that is very, very, very unlikely, um, we may decline to make the represent to make the referral or just outright say we're, we can't refer it if the only way that you can pay is on a contingent basis. And this is not a typical contingent basis type of a case. Some cases, it's unethical to take them on a contingent basis. Divorce cases, at least in Pennsylvania, fall into that category. You can't take a divorce case for, on our rules of professional conduct on a contingent, uh, contingent fee basis. So affordability is another big reason why we might not refer somebody. So I'm just going to stop here for a moment and uh, suggest to you all that if you have questions, you can drop them into the chat. Um, we will. I will. Uh, take a look at those questions at the end. We'll go through them and maybe have some opportunity for some Q&A at the end as well. But if you have questions along the way, please, by all means, drop them into the chat and we will take a look at them uh, towards the end. 
So let's talk a little bit about what that preferred member discount really is. I'm going to start by telling you what it isn't. It's not a guarantee that an attorney is going to take your case. So we don't guarantee members that we're going to find a lawyer who is going to take their case. All we guarantee them or tell them is if they have a case that seemingly is referable, that we will make an attempt to find an attorney who is willing to take their case. But we can't guarantee that there's, we're going to be able to make a match out there. Sometimes there's just not a match. Um, the discount means it's a 25% discount on matters that are handled on an hourly basis, okay? 25% discount on matters that are handled on an hourly basis. But recall, I said that lawyers handle things on flat fee basis, handle them on a contingent basis, maybe some type of a hybrid um, in those situations. There is no discount on matters that are handled um, that are on flat fee, contingent, non-hourly, right? There's no discount on fee arrangements that are not hourly. So and that's right in the contract. So very important to understand. Uh, I wouldn't tell everybody as a blanket statement that you're gonna get a 25% discount off of the lawyer's rates, right? That would actually not be um, accurate, right? So it's 25% if the, off of the hourly rate if the, if the matter is handled on an hourly basis. It's also important to note that there are other charges that law firms typically invoice their clients for whenever they're handling a legal matter for them. And there are no discounts on those other types of charges. So some attorneys use paralegals um, or administrative staff to do some of the work on a case and charge that through to the client. That's perfectly appropriate. Um, lawyers don't do all of the work on clients' cases typically. And in, if you have a law firm, they are gonna rely on paralegals administrative staff to do some of the work that is required on a case. Uh, I, I keep coming back to bankruptcy for some reason, but I would say bankruptcy cases, um, domestic relations, especially divorces, um, those, types, uh, those types of cases are going to probably use a lot more paralegals involved because they are gonna be collecting documents and reviewing them and assembling them. Um, if you have a litigation case, they're gonna be paralegals typically involved if a law firm is using paralegals. So those rates typically do get charged through to the client on invoices and there's no discount on those. Of course, there's no discount on filing fees and other court costs. We don't have the ability to discount those. We charge those through to the clients. Um, charges for administrative services, such as copies, overnight delivery, um, wire transfers, uh, things of that nature. There's no discount under the contract on those and case costs. So if there's a deposition, you know, in the case, the court reporter is going to charge a fee not only to appear, but also for the transcript. Those are not discounted. Those are going to be charged through at their regular rate. Title searches, um, if you have an appraiser involved in a real estate matter or a litigation case, you know, all of those types of things are not discounted. But, and they are very common examples of costs that are, uh, that are charged in cases. So let's talk a little bit about the referral network. Um, we refer members only to attorneys in our proprietary network of referral lawyers. And we've been putting this together for a long, long time. We have relationships with a lot of our referral lawyers that go back years and years and years, right? We do receive um, inquiries from attorneys from time to time to be in the referral network. We receive inquiries from associates or recommendations by associates for attorneys to be in the referral network. Um, you know, that, that's okay. We, they, they, we come by them in lots of different ways. Sometimes we recruit them because they're in geographic areas where we don't have uh, enough coverage and we have some members there. And so we, we do do a, lot of, a fair amount of recruiting. So the criteria uh, for the lawyers in our referral network, of course, they have to be licensed. Um, they can't have any public discipline of any kind. So by their state bar association or bar not a bar association, but whatever their regulating entity is in the state. They can't have any public discipline where they've done something wrong. Um, they have to have malpractice insurance at um, certain minimum levels that we require. It's above whatever the legal limit is. They have to have a certain amount of experience 
and they also have to agree to comply with our service standards. Now, I can't speak for other provider firms out there, but we do have our referral lawyers sign a document committing uh, to comply with service standards, and we do um, we do state what those service standards are. All provider firms engage in ongoing training of their referral network. And uh, I can speak to us that uh, we offer them continuing legal education. So my law firm is a um, registered certified provider of continuing legal education in Pennsylvania. And we're a distance learning provider as well. So we can offer our attorneys credits if they attend our um, web our webinars online. Usually we offer them on a like an hour at a time, oftentimes over lunch on particular areas of law topics that are going on. Um, we do that for them for free. Um, so they get some free continuing legal education credits they might otherwise have to pay for. So it's a give back to them for being in our network and treating our members so well. Um, we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with our attorneys in our referral network as well. And I do in particular. So I do schedule them on a monthly basis and I speak oftentimes spend an hour or two invested in getting prepared for and participating in that call. And I do talk to them about particular things. A lot of them are service related and just getting an idea of what their experience is out there and what they're seeing. But I want to make sure that we see eye to eye on what our expectations are of them. And then we also send our referral lawyers quarterly newsletters where we share information about Legal Shield. We update them on, on service standards and just talk about the doing, doing what we do, but doing it better. We assure quality uh, to, our, to our, legal, uh, our Legal Shield members through the vetting process, through the one-on-one -on -one conversations, the ongoing training, that we have, the relationships that we've developed with them for a long time, but really the most important way that we assure quality from our referral attorneys is that we, we send lots of referrals to few law firms, right? Because whenever you're in the referral network, if you're getting lots of calls from my staff making referrals to you, I'm more important to you. And so whenever I call and say, I've got a concern about something, you, that referral lawyer is going to have a greater sense of urgency to respond to a member of my staff whenever they want to talk about that or respond to me whenever I'm giving them a call. If they hear from me once a month or once every other month with a potential referral, I'm not really that important to them and they might not return my call as quickly as I might like otherwise. So we get a lot of responsiveness from uh, referral firms by the volume of referrals that we send to them. And then we also um, very much appreciate receiving surveys uh, from members um, about their experience with our, um, or with our referral lawyers. And so big takeaway for you uh, to talk to your members that, and your customers and your new customers potentially, if they are referred uh, to a referral lawyer, please encourage them to respond to the survey that is sent to them by the Legal Shield, the home office. They're going to be sending that out. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But big takeaway, please encourage your members, your customers, if they are referred to a referral lawyer, respond to that survey and let the home office know what their experience is. We get copies of those, we read them, and then we also talk to the referral lawyers about what's on those surveys. So hey Mike. I see Noemi just popped yeah. in here. <laughs> just real quick, when we refer a member, they will receive two surveys. They yeah. will refer, they will receive a survey for their interaction with our law firm, and they will also receive a survey for their interaction with the referral um, attorney. So it's important that they answer both of those surveys. Yep, we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we go through the referral process. So referral process. It always follows a consultation with an attorney at Fifth Law Group or your provider law firm. There might be rare instances when somebody calls us for a request for service that we would send them directly through to a referral lawyer. Um, and that would typically be on something that's very urgent or something that we have a special relationship with a referral lawyer on maybe it's an immigration type case, whatever. There are very, very few instances where we're, we, we're not talking to these folks first. 
to make sure they've gotten the benefits of their telephone consultation, document review, letter writing, whatever it is that we can do for them at no additional charge under the plan, we are taking care of that. And only when we've provided all of those benefits are we going to send them out to a referral lawyer whenever a referral is appropriate. So what happens next? Um, one of my attorneys who's talked to, let's say Rod Boudelette when he calls in and they realize that you know Rod needs to be referred out to an attorney outside of our office. So that attorney and on my staff types up some notes and then you know indicates that we need to get Rod to an attorney in his area to, to help further assist him with whatever that legal matter. So I have a referral department in house. I've got a couple of uh, staff members that have been doing this for a long time. Um, they're like every referral lawyer's favorite person all across the state because they know when they're getting a call from you know, Jen, that's a happy day for them because they're getting a potential client. Um, my referral department will locate referral, a referral attorney or two or three in the geographic area where that member needs a lawyer and will be identifying lawyers who practice in the area of law that relate to the matter that is to be referred. And we get all of that information from our referral lawyers. They tell us these are the areas of law that we practice in. So we're not gonna send a divorce case to an attorney just because he happens to be in a particular city whenever he's told us that he only handles real estate transactions, right? We're gonna refer that member on a divorce matter to a lawyer in that town who tells us that they regularly handle divorce matters. There are occasions when it might be a little bit difficult to find somebody for a particular legal matter that is highly specialized, but in the vast, vast majority of those situations, we're gonna place them with somebody who has expertise and experience in whatever it is that they need help with. Um, we're gonna send out multiple requests to lawyers in that area. And quite frankly, whoever responds first is gonna get the referral um, because we want to uh, connect our referral lawyers with the members as quickly as possible. That's something that we really, really were focusing on in 2020 is taking a look at what prevents our referral lawyers from getting together with our, with our members as quickly as possible. What are the friction points that were there? So we, we identified some things that we thought were friction points that we've addressed. And one of them is that we send a packet of the member's name and contact information, our notes about whatever it is that we talked to that member about, any uh, re related documents. We send that to the referral attorney via email and via text. So very, very quickly, the referral lawyer, as soon as he or she says, yes, I would be happy to talk to Rod, um, the he or she has an email in their inbox and a text on their phone. Here's how to get a hold of Rod, right? Uh, please give him a call. And then we also send the referral lawyer's name and contact information. Um, we send that to the member via email and text as well. And so Rod is going to be getting an email and text that says, here's how to get a hold of your lawyer. Please give them a buzz. They're waiting for you to call. And so we're trying to put them together as quickly as possible, right? That's the name of the game. Uh, we will make up to three referral attempts. So let's say Rod calls that attorney and for whatever reason, um, they, they, they decide not to work together. Rod says, can you send me to somebody else? He calls us back and we will make an attempt, uh, two more attempts to refer Rod um, to another attorney who might be willing to ha handle his case. Maybe that lawyer isn't available um, or can't meet Rod's timelines or deadlines and just says, I'm sorry, I wish I could help you Rod, but I can't call FIFIC Law Group back and, and I'm sure they'll be able to connect you with somebody else. And so we will do that. We'll make up to three attempts. Um, now, if the three, if you've struck out three times because the case isn't good, right? Or you can't re afford to pay, you know, that kind of a thing, uh, we won't make additional attempts after that, right? But three attempts, and rarely do we need to make three attempts to get somebody connected with an attorney. Um, that follow-up survey, this is what uh, Noemi was referring to. Um, uh, we send a follow-up survey to the referral lawyer asking about the outcomes you know, of the referral. I, I respond to them myself. And so we ask the attorney, um, Noemi, if, you, if you're uh, there, how, how quickly do we send that out? About, it's about a week after, right? 
It's five business days after we make the referral is when we automatically send an email out to the referral attorney checking in with them. Right. So we want to know, have you talked to that member? That's again, it's just a trigger. Oh my gosh, I forgot to call that person. We want them to call the member. And then we ask them to tell us, did you talk to them? Did they retain you? Um, we ask them to rate the, the quality of the referral on a one to five uh, star scale because we want to know that we're sending all the good information that they need in order to make decisions to, um, to, to uh, take these clients on. So we want to make good referrals to them with all of the information that they need. And then we ask them to maybe tell us a little bit about whatever the experience was so that we can take a look at that information and, you know, it helps us do our job better at the end of the day. Um, and then the uh, Noemi mentioned before that Legal Shield sends out a survey to the member. We also send a survey to the member as well, asking how was your experience. And then Legal Shield sends ones out. And that comes 14 days, right? The Legal Shield survey comes 14 days <clears throat> after correct. we make the referral. That's so correct. really important for the members to respond to that because Legal Shield wants to know. We want to know. We pass that information on privately, of course, to the referral lawyers because we want them to know what, um, what the feedback is. That's very valuable information for them, valuable for us. It helps us identify um, referral lawyers that might not be cut, cutting the mustard you know, in the, in the network or need a little bit of help or some training or, or encouragement, you know, whatever it is. It, we do take a look at those and we do follow up with referral lawyers because we want that experience for the member to be good all the way through their touch points in using their membership, not just with us, but also with the referral lawyers too, because they're an extension of the Legal Shield attorney network. So we, we really want that consistency of experience and quality of the customer service to go all the way through. And the only way we can, we can really work on that is if we have more information about the member's experience whenever they have talked to the uh, referral lawyers. So real important. Okay, so what to expect once a referral is made? So this is, you know, think about your client calling you to say, what should I expect whenever I get referred to a referral attorney? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is there will probably be an additional consultation with that referral lawyer and try as we might to give them as much information as we uh, have. They're going to want to talk to the member about the legal matter again. And there may be some repetition, right? And so hopefully customers aren't unhappy if they say, well, I had to tell the referral lawyer my story all over again. You know, that's, that's kind of unavoidable. So we just don't want folks to think that that lawyer is going to be sort of hitting the ground running. They are hitting the ground running to some extent because we've provided them with a lot of information, but they're going to want to ask their own questions and talk to that member again. So that's just something that they should expect uh, to happen out there. Um, there will be no additional free services. So if we are referring somebody to a referral lawyer, um, we have provided all of the free services or the included services under their membership. So there won't be an additional document review for free. There won't be another letter that the referral lawyer will send out for free, or they won't be making calls on the member's behalf. This means that now they have to retain that lawyer. So after that initial consultation, um, typically is free. I mean, I, most of the referral lawyers will talk to the member, at least initially, to get an idea of whether this is a case that they want to take. But after that, they're going to be uh, fees generally will be applicable. Uh, the members should be prepared to pay a retainer or the flat fee um, in advance and in advance for costs. So that's going to be something that they have to be prepared to do. Lots of lawyers take checks, they take credit cards. Um, they take all different types of electronic forms of payment. We encourage them that that's a good idea for them uh, to, to do. It just makes it easier for them to get retained and for the member to get things started um, so they don't have to bring a check in all the way to the office of some kind. Um, but they have to be prepared to pay, those, pay the fees up front. Um, what also to expect is the attorney may not agree to uh, provide services. When we refer somebody, we do tell the member, look, there's not a guarantee that this person is going to take your case. They may not file that appeal for you. They may not agree to attend that hearing for you. So 
Um, don't sort of rest on your laurels, um, especially if you're having a difficult time connecting with the referral lawyer, right? Let us know if you're having problems, we'll refer you to somebody else, but don't just assume that the lawyer is going to agree to take your case. There are lots of reasons why lawyers don't take cases. Um, and sometimes it's just scheduling, you know, you call and say, my hearing's next week. Oh, I'm on vacation to Disney with my kids. I can't do it. You know, I've got another hearing scheduled on that day at that time. Lots of reasons why lawyers can't handle those cases. And so uh, we want to make sure that uh, clients and, and, and customers know that the, don't, don't take it for granted that the attorney is going to take the case. So, Noemi, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that if in our with our firm, if we have a member that's having some issues connecting with the referral attorney, either myself or Jen from our referral department will reach out to them and find out what, what the disconnect is or schedule time for both the referral attorney and the member to talk. We will help facilitate that. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we want to connect them. That's that's really, really important. Um, and again. Uh, I want to reiterate, because it's so important, a survey will be sent by Legal Shield 14 days following the referral is made from our firm. Very important for members to respond to that. So we'll talk a little bit about your questions. Uh, let me see what we have in the chat. And before I do that, before I exit the, um, the slide deck, I just wanted to let you all know that we are recording this session. It will replay once we get it all edited and things of that nature on our YouTube channel. So if you just Google YouTube FIFIC Law Group, you will find our channel out there. There are lots of videos on there for you to look at for associate workouts and a variety of others. Um, we have a couple of upcoming webinars. You can register on Eventbrite. Again, if you search for us, and maybe you can just subscribe to it so that whenever we post new webinars, you'll get a notice and you can decide whether you wanna register. Uh, July 13th, uh, I will be presenting a webinar on auto insurance. We'll be talking about uh, what impacts your auto insurance rates. And we're going to talk a lot about credit reports and uh, traffic violations, right? At least from the Pennsylvania perspective. Um, but I think it's pretty much true in other states. Credit reports in particular have an impact on your insurance rates. And so this is, again, a continuation of some of the writings and posts that we've done trying to help folks get better insurance for less money, right? And just be smart consumers out there. July 20th, we're gonna be presenting one for small business owners on human resources, worker classifications. So if you know of any of your customers, your small business customers that have employees, that'll be one that they're gonna to wanna to work on too, or uh, attend as well. And I will tell you, although we don't have it scheduled yet, we are going to have a fellow that does safe driving courses. And he's gonna talk in particular about the dangers of texting and driving distracted drivers, teen drivers, distracted driving. So that will probably be scheduled in July or August. It'd be something maybe if you have kids or know any of your customers that have teens um, that are getting ready to drive or that are driving, that might be something that they'll want their children to watch, um, their kids to watch. Uh, Jim is really, really good. My daughter took driving lessons from him. He has a big driving school here in the Pittsburgh area and he has kindly agreed to, uh, to do that webinar. And I'm gonna tell you a funny story uh, during that webinar about my daughter's driving, uh, my driving lessons with somebody on his staff. So that's a teaser. You have to attend in order to hear that funny story. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share right now. And uh, let me take a look at we, what we have in the chat. Any particular questions that you wanted to, um, wanted me to, to talk about? Let's see here. Uh, on a divorce case, so Jimmy asks on a divorce case, um, and you can you can unmute yourself if you want to chime in here. On a divorce case, can a member pay the retainer in installments? Yeah, that's a great question, Jimmy, and thanks for asking about that. It's really up to the individual um, attorney whether they're willing to do that. Um, I, if they're willing to take it on installments, what they might say is you can pay the pay the retainer in installments, but I won't begin work until I've received all of the installment payments, right? Same thing with a bankruptcy that we typically do that for bankruptcies, you know, especially on a chapter seven bankruptcy. We have to have the full fee paid in advance plus the costs. Members can pay us in installments, but we won't begin the case or we won't file the case until we have all of the installment payments in. 
that's really something that the, the, the lawyer has to decide. They're not going to want to get paid for the entire divorce case up front, typically, because you never know exactly how it's going to go. Depends on, you know, how much fighting occurs in the divorce case. Hopefully it's not that much. Uh, divorce cases can be not terribly expensive, can be super expensive. So they're going to want to get paid along the way on those. So let's see. Um, somebody asked me, what's the average length of time and years the referral attorneys have worked with FIFIC Law Group? You know, it's hard for me to answer that question because there are, I don't know how many thousand um, lawyers in the Pennsylvania referral attorney base, but I would say that my top 10 or 20 law lawyers, law firms that, um, that, are, that I send most of the cases to have all been with us for 10 or 20 years. I mean, long time, right? Um, and we're also if, constantly recruiting Mike. Yeah, for new, attorney, for new attorney, attorneys to join our network. Yeah, you know, if a member has concerned a, a concern about uh, their interactions with referral lawyers or the services that they're they're receiving, um, maybe non-responsiveness or something like that. Yes, they should absolutely contact us. Right, we we can if you haven't talked to the if you can't get a hold of the referral lawyer or talk to them first about it, give us a buzz. We can try to help get some conversation going to solve, you know, some of those, those problems for you. Yvette asks, um, can you review once again, the preferred member discount on a 35% hourly rate? Are you saying that what the attorney normally charges on an hourly basis, they would get 25% off the rate. So let's say that my hourly rate, if I'm handling a case on an hourly basis, my rates $300 an hour, it's going to be my rate to the legal shield member will be discounted by 25%, whatever 25% of 300 is. I'm terrible at math. So maybe somebody knows that number right off the bat, but you know, so on my bill anyway, that goes out to the legal shield member, just so you all know, I, I can't speak for all provider firms. We do ask referral lawyers to do this, but I, I I'm not involved in their invoicing, but we invoice them at the regular rate and at the bottom of their invoice, it will show their legal shield discount. So they're going to see the dollar value, right, of that preferred member discount on every invoice that we send to them, right? That's, again, just reaffirming the value of the membership to them. I hope that answers Yvette's question. If not, um, let me know. I'm, re I'm reading this as I go down. So <laughs> Harvey, hi, Harvey. How you doing, Harvey Fox? Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Noemi to tell that story again. You know, she and Harvey just did. I want to. I don't want to call it a drive-in. It was a. It was a horse and buggy in. Some will signing for some Amish that uh, Harvey is selling into the Amish community here in Pennsylvania. I've never seen anything like that before. But uh, you know, you learn something new every day. But Harvey asks, can a member who will be referred request to be referred to a specific attorney um, if that attorney is not currently in the referral network? Um, you know, we we don't we don't suggest that you make those rep representations because uh, number one, we might not want that person to be in the network. <laughs> and do you really want us to tell your client, no, we can't have that person in the network because they've got some public discipline or they don't have malpractice insurance or they don't meet our criteria. Um, if you, you know, if there's somebody out there that you want us to take a look at, we're happy to do it. But at the point of referral, it's probably not a very good time to do that. Right now, if somebody's in the referral network and they've, worked with that lawyer in the past and would like to be referred there again, absolutely, we take that into consideration, right? Um, Beatrice asks, what's the link to your YouTube channel? Somebody posted it, Noemi did already. Thank you, I appreciate that. So I'm just going down the, down the thing here. Um, Patty asks, do you refer when there is a conflict of interest because both sides have relationship with the provider firm? Yes, yes, we do, right? So. If it's two unrelated members, whoever calls us, right, is, is who we provide services for. Or if, if we know that there's a conflict, then they're going to get referred out, right? They're both going to get referred out. We're not going to represent one legal shield member against another legal shield member. And they'll get referred out to somebody in the referral network. And we do cover the cost for that consultation, like the law, us, okay. Pacific Law Group yeah. would cover the cost <clears throat> for that consultation for the. Yeah, that does, that's a no additional cost to the members. Okay. Um, I have another question kind of on Sure. That. I had a member, <laughs> happens to be a shirt tail relative, doesn't make that easier. 
but she was referred out and what ended up happening, it was something very personal and the lawyer that got referred to is somebody she knows that she did not want to have know that information. Oh, is there, I mean, is there any work around on that? I mean, there was no way to know that obviously, but she's very unhappy. She's been very happy up until now, but she was very unhappy about it. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, that's a tough situation. I, that's the first I've heard of that happening. So it's so rare. Um, you know, I don't know how you would vet that. Uh, we want to refer Patty, Patty McPhee to you, Mr. Lurie. Do you know Patty McPhee, you know, <laughs> or do we, maybe we let you know first, this is who we're going to refer you to. Um, that's an interesting thing. We'll have to take that, think about that noodle on that a little bit, but yeah, that's, it's very I unusual. I will be contacting Randy or Joe and find out what they have to say, but it, it did come up and that was one of those where after it came up, I went, I wonder if that's happened before that can't be that unusual. Yeah. And, and I could see where I would be very uncomfortable if a particular person got specific information. Oh yeah. Like your neighbor or somebody or, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's unusual. That's a first for me. Now it doesn't mean that it hasn't happened with for us. I just may not know about it, but Noemi, are you aware of that ever happening? I'm not aware of that ever happening in our firm, but if, you know, I would say that if you know, if the member knows of an attorney that they don't want to work with, the best thing to do is let us know. Yeah. And now they may not the intake. Yeah. <laughs> they don't always know that who's in the referral network, but right. Yeah, that's, that's one of those quirks. So Randall asks, what motivates a referral attorney to provide high level of service? Our service stands at a 25% discounted rate rather than charging the full rate. That's a good question. I mean, we talked a lot about what we do to um, get compliance with our service standards. And, you know, those surveys are super important. We want to know what everybody's experiences are out there. So um, we do a we, we want to know that if, if they're not, if we're getting bad surveys on an attorney and we only are going to know about that, if they're sending the surveys back, the members are, then that tells us that there might be an issue out there. If we have a lawyer who has a very low, what I call conversion rate, meaning um, out of, they only, they only get hired one out of 10 times that we refer somebody to them. That tells me that there's probably a problem of some kind, either they're not very nice or they're charging too much money or they're too selective. Um, that gives us an indication too, because we have a pretty good idea of what the average conversion rate is for cases across the state. We know what our own internal conversion rate is. And so if one, somebody has a very low one, number one, we tell them, and oftentimes they're very surprised, like, why am I not getting more people to hire me? They want to know all about that. And so it's usually a really good opportunity for us to have a conversation with them. So that's why we really want that member feedback. Let's see, Barbara asks, if you are the first to call in and then it's discovered that the other party is covered with Legal Shield, how do you decision made who you choose? Well, we do a conflict check. You know, it's not always perfect, especially if the member, if the opposing party is a Legal Shield member from a different state, we can't, we don't have that database. We don't know who they are. Um, so, but if we, have a, we do a conflict check internally and they're both legal shield members. We refer both out as, as known we talked about before. Um, Karen asks, what are some examples of cases that are referred and not covered under the membership? Well, if you don't have any benefits, we're not going to refer it. Right. But sometimes it's not covered. And I think the case and good example of this are, member has a family plan. They call in with a business related matter. There are no benefits under the family plan for business matters, except, you know, very, very limited to older memberships. Um, we may do a courtesy referral for that person for that business related matter to somebody, right? And we will ask the referral lawyer to extend a courtesy discount, even though there are really no benefits for that business related matter under that membership, right? That's a, that's a, that's a common example that we deal with. Can you think of any others off, offhand, Noemi? No, that, that, that would be the most common one. Yeah. I mean, if it's a member, they don't have any benefits for this matter. They want to retain somebody. Um, we do try to, to extend courtesies to them. We do, we try not to tell them no. 
if we can help them, we want to help them any way we can. Uh, we will probably tell them that they should call the home office and upgrade their membership to include business benefits. Uh, we are doing that more and more often. I hope you all appreciate that because hopefully you're getting credit for it. <laughs> I hope that that's how it works. Our only thing that we can do is send them to the home office because we don't know who the associate is that's associated with them. So we send them back to the home office and tell them we, they should upgrade. Uh, we do a lot of checking on membership status whenever they call us. And if their membership is um, in any way having a payment problem or something like that, we send them back to the home office before we will provide service to them so that they can get their membership straightened up. And uh, we're just trying to help you not lose memberships over funky things like their credit card changed recently and, and it's not getting paid. That's typically the problem, uh -huh. right? There are a lot of cancellations because of that and it just doesn't get caught up very soon. But if they're calling us at the point of service and we see that um, you know, their credit card's been declined or there's been a, an issue there, we send them to the home office first. They don't mind. They're, they're, sometimes they, oftentimes they don't know that there's an issue and they really don't mind uh, taking care of that first before they call us back. So, and we hope that that's, again, it's another way we're trying to support you all out there. Um, the July webinar about HR worker classifications, Jimmy asks, is that open for us to invite business owners? Absolutely. Um, we encourage you to invite your customers to our webinars, except for the associate ones, right? These are just for you. We talk shop. But all of the other ones, they are 100% in invitation opportunities for you all to invite your customers or your potential customers. They can get to see us, meet us, learn a little bit of something. It's an easy way for you to connect with customers and potential customers because it's not a salesy type thing. You can say, hey, I saw this webinar. I thought it might be interesting to you. Um, I'm going to attend. Why don't you attend too? That's an easy connect, right? A connect contact with a customer that maybe ends up as a sales a sale for you, right? So let's see here. Somebody asks, how do we explain to clients that they will get a 25% discount for matters only to find out that certain issues are fixed rate by the law firm? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think all you could do is tell them what the membership benefits are, which is you get a 25% discount on matters that are handled on an hourly basis, but there's no discount on flat fee and contingent cases, right? That's all you can tell them. Um, I could give you a list of legal matters that are typically handled one way or the other. I can guarantee you that I'll probably be wrong uh, because lawyers handle them all different kinds of ways. Um, you know, so I think you're best off just sticking with whatever the membership says so that they know, hopefully, um, whenever they call the referral lawyer and the referral lawyer gives them a quote. We do ask the referral lawyers to discount their rates on all matters, right, as a courtesy because these are Legal Shield members. And we tell them that Legal Shield members are price sensitive. That's not a, I'm not, that doesn't, that's not intended to be disparaging in any way. Um, we, we, I think people do have an expectation they're going to get a, a very good lawyer for below market rates. That's a general expectation that they have. And so we do encourage our referral lawyers that that's the general expectation. And so if you can discount from your street rate, uh, we really, I think that's a, that's better for you, better for us, better for the members. Um, and so we do encourage them to do that. Webinars, Yvette asks, are they PA specific or can business owner for a member from another state take these? Um, I will say that there are PA specific things in all of our webinars, but they are generally applicable no matter where you're from, right? So if I'm talking about risk mitigation for a business owner to help protect their personal assets from their business risks, I, you know, I don't practice in Arizona or Texas or Colorado, but pretty much I, I think the general principles are going to apply there and there may be specifics, but that's why they have provider firms. They can talk to the provider firm about these general ideas that I'm giving to them um, and get something that's a specific plan just for them. But these webinars are going to be I, useful for anybody wherever they're calling in from. Sometimes we do things that are on federal related things, like we've offered webinars on social security retirement planning. That applies everywhere, right? Or tax planning for retirement. That applies everywhere because that's mostly federal income tax law, federal law. So that's gonna apply everywhere. 
Okay, let's see here. Um, Patty asks, what happens if you do not have an attorney who specializes in the area of law or they are too busy to get it done in the time contracted with Legal Shield? You know, it does happen rarely that we can't uh, put a, a referral lawyer with a member, right? Rarely. Is it due to some kind of, you know, hyper specialization? You know, if you're looking for somebody that specializes in, you know, Bitcoin trans transaction, securitized Bitcoin transactions for, you know, um, uh, complex real estate things, probably going to have a difficult time connecting you with somebody because it's so highly specialized, right? But that's not really a problem that we run into very frequently. So I wouldn't really worry about that. It, it's just rare that we can't put somebody together. Uh, if I have not covered adequately the discount rate topic, um, somebody can just let me know. You can just chime in. If there's something, if you have a particular question about it, that if I've not covered it, are immigration deportation cases able to be referred out? Jimmy, you know, that's not my area of specialty, but we probably would refer them to an immig immigration lawyer if the person is here in the United States. Um, they have to be a member, of course. So, uh, you know, that's the only way it's going to be covered. So some immigration matters are not going to be covered because they're not members. Um, so that, that's not really my area of expertise. In, in Texas, I can understand why you'd be asking that question if you're down there. That, that might be a good one to, to ask um, Brian or, or John Sotterelli down there. Regina asks, if both members in a case are legal shield and they have been referred, are they fully covered? With... So on, on the letter writing consultation document review, we refer them out. That's no additional charge to them. If they have to retain somebody because it, it's a quote unquote referral related matter where it's a fee generating case, then it's on their dime, right? If the discount applies, we don't cover that. Ricky asks, how is the WOW program with referral lawyers going? Um, so yeah, the WOW program, that's an old term. <laughs> so we don't use it anymore, but that's okay. I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to say that 2021, 2022 are real emphasis for the entire provider network to uh, work on the referral network, right? And we want to we want to more closely associate with them, uh, uh, with the referral with our network of lawyers. We want to work more closely with them, and we want to work on customer service, right? We don't have very good data about the customer satisfaction for referral lawyers because we don't get very much. That's part of the problem. Whenever, you know, when you're the one complaining customer is the one that's going to say something. And there are 10 others that are really happy out there that don't say anything at all. That's just the rule of thumb in life, right? So that's why we need more referral res responses to surveys so that we get a better idea of what's really going on. You know, I'll look at survey responses and I'll see some member has sent in a negative 100 survey for a referral lawyer who I know is a very good referral lawyer, but it's the only one that that person has gotten in the last three months. And it's because he or she turned that person's case down. You know what I mean? More likely than not. And so the mad person's mad and they send a, an angry survey in. Not always. Sometimes they have legitimate beefs about what's going on. But if I only get one survey response for that lawyer, and I, over the last three months, I've sent him 120 referrals, it doesn't tell me anything, you know, it just tells me about one person's experience. I need, you know, 12 or 20 uh, survey responses to tell me something about that. So their net rep the referral network's net promoter score is lower than the net promoter score for the, for the provider network. I will say that. But what I will say is, and number one, that data is bad for the reasons that I just told you. Secondly, the referral network's net promoter score is higher than the net promoter score for the legal industry on average, which is 25, right? The industry average to the best that I can figure this out. There's not a lot of reports out there, but there are some. It's about 25. The referral network's higher than that. So that's some good news, bad news there, right? 
but we need to get more information about them. That's why we want it. Um, again, Joe had asked, and I'll just remind everyone that this is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel at Fifth Law Group. So if you search YouTube, you can get it there. Give it a day or two. We, we'll get it up there. Um, if there's a conflict of interest, does Legal Shield Corporate assign the referral attorney? You want to answer that, Naomi? Yep, sorry, I didn't mute myself. No, sure. Legal Shield does not. We, as a provider firm, will assign the, the um, attorney to assist with the conflict. Okay. Um, the slide deck will only be available on the replay, right? If somebody, if somebody asks about that, we, we don't typically send the slide decks out. Jerry passes along a very high compliment to one of the referral lawyers who uh, did some handling some work for her son. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Um, Let's see here. Some of these are just about, the, okay, YouTube, thanks for answering those. <laughs> if you guys are all paying attention to that, I appreciate it. Are there any other questions on here? Mary, uh, Mary, you're from Chicago. That's my daughter. My oldest daughter lives in Chicago, by the way. She lives in Oak Brook, um, although moving into the city. Um, I'm glad that you've got some appreciation for selling memberships. So um, thank you for Thank you for, for selling. We, we welcome anybody that wants to sell in Pennsylvania, by the way. We think we provide great support for associates. So uh, we want you to sell here in Pennsylvania, but also your states too. And uh, we love uh, Frank and Dave up in Chicago. They're a couple of my favorite, my favorite people. So you've got a great provider firm up there in Chicago. Um, Whitney asks, is it still a cover benefit if there is a conflict and the issue is referred out yeah, I mean, your membership travels with you. So if there's a conflict, you still get the benefits, right? Don't get misunderstood about us providing benefits versus somebody else providing benefits, at least as it relates to the frontline stuff. So when you call your provider firm, if they do a conflict check and the other person that you have a problem with um, is a member, you both get referred out, but you're going to get your benefits, right? Just as if the provider firm was providing the benefits. Right. Also, so, Mike, if, if they they have an issue and it's governed by PA law, but they live in Indi Indianapolis or Kentucky, wherever they live, you get your benefits. You'll consult with one of our Pennsylvania attorneys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll if you have an Indiana related matter, we're going to send you to, um, well, Marvin Okun just retired. So we'll send you to Jeff Hintermeister, right? <laughs> yeah, I think Marvin is uh, just recently retired or announced his retirement anyway. I don't know if that's, but Jeff Hintermeister is a great lawyer over there too. So we'll send you over to Jeff. So it looks like we've run through all the questions. Any final questions before we uh, tie it up here? And if you can just. Mike, I have one. Sure. If we have a member that they bought the membership street price and they have a conflict with an employer that offers our benefit as a voluntary benefit, that employer does not have the amendment. Would they, the member still be able to use their membership against the employer? Uh, yes. So if the member is not part of that group with an amendment, okay, they're going to be entitled to their benefits. But we, we, that's what we call a soft conflict where the home office doesn't want the provider firms sending nasty grams to companies that have a legal shield group in them. So those will get referred out to another firm who will provide the benefits to the member, right? It, so the company is going to get a nasty gram. It just won't be from the provider law firm, right? If that's the case, if I'm making that clear, is, it, is that understandable? Yes. Okay. One more thing is as long as I've kind of got the platform, what I tell people is that there is a preferred member discount, but I don't tell them what the percentage is going to be. I tell them as a member, you have a preferred member discount. So you're sure you're getting the best price for top quality law firms to avoid that conflict of, is it 25% or is it 20% they gave me? Is it a flat fee thing? So it, that's how I avoid that problem. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a reasonable way to approach that. So 
I All right, everybody. Okay, so, Jimmy, yep, go ahead. Fire yeah, away. So I have a uh, question, not about this, uh, what you covered today, but um, a few weeks ago, um, you had a uh, webinar on the trademark process. Has that been posted to YouTube? Because I was looking for it yesterday and couldn't find it. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware that it wasn't on there. Um, I'll check with my PR guy and make sure that it gets posted. But yeah, that will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel. I think Josh gave us permission to do that. So I'll double right, check and uh, see if we're going to do that. Thanks. That was a great webinar. So I appreciate that. Um, Hi, this is Teresa. Hi. Um, so I want to go back to what Rod just asked. He said, if the, I want to make, get clarification. If the person, if the company does not have the amendment, and the individual works for the company and they're not on the group benefit, then if they can still use our service against? Well, let's make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, so that's number, why I want a clarification. It's the member who has the amendment, okay? The amendment is attached to a member's plan. That's where it's at, okay? The company doesn't have the amendment. The okay. member has the amendment. Okay. okay? So let's say that um, Rod has a family plan, right? And he calls us and says, I have a problem with the McPhee company, okay? And the McPhee company um, has a legal shield group there. They have a group plan for employ their employees, okay? Rod's membership doesn't have an amendment on it that relates to the McPhee company at all. So he's, and he's, he's gonna be entitled to his benefits against whatever issues he has against the McPhee company. Mm -hmm. In that instance, okay, that's considered a marketing conflict. The home office doesn't want the McPhee company to get mean letters from the provider firm, otherwise they might get up unhappy. So we refer Rod out to a referral lawyer who, We'll provide his benefits to him. We, we, you know, if there's a cost to that, we pick up the tab for letter writing, consultation, document review, you know, the, the old Title I benefits, right? The mm -hmm. Okay. And that happens, right? Th that's how that happens. So okay. the only members who can't use their membership against the McPhee company are employee members of the McPhee group, right? Who, who have that amendment on their plan. They're the only ones who can't use their membership against the McPhee company, right? Does that, does that help? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. I hope I didn't confuse myself there. That was a challenge. <laughs> I no one will check me if I'm getting it wrong, so. <laughs> okay, Any, I'll take one last question if there's one more. None? Okay, great. <laughs> one last well, question, one last question. All right, one all, right, last all right, question. here he is. We'll let Ricky ask right. the last question. We know we're at the tipping point. How how is the law firm staff to on to take on all these memberships that Miss Teresa Wright and everyone else on this call? There's going to be a large influx of memberships. Are we uh, are we ready for we that? We are staffed. Don't worry about that. You just sell. Don't worry about provider firms being staffed. We are staffed to handle it. So that is the least of your problems. We right? appreciate all that you do. We appreciate all that y'all do. Thank you. Sell the Dickens out of this thing. It's a great plan. So, all right, everybody. Well, thank you again for attending. Uh, spread the word. If you like the webinars, tell your, tell your other associates, your downlines. Uh, check us out on Eventbrite. And uh, we, we hope to see you soon. Thank you to so many of you who attend all the time. Jimmy is one of our most dedicated uh, attendees. We really appreciate that, Rod, as well. So thank you very much. And have a great evening. And a great fourth. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.